It's Minnesota Now on NPR News. I'm Kathy Werzer. What must it be like to have a day in your honor in your own hometown? Not many people have experienced the feeling, but last week, the city of Duluth declared April 5th Daniel Durant Day. Daniel grew up in Duluth, but his acting career shot him to stardom far beyond the Twin Ports. He just returned to Minnesota after his recent film called CODA won the Oscar for Best Picture. The title CODA is an acronym for Child of Deaf Adults. In the movie, Durant plays Leo, one of two young adult children of deaf parents. Those actors, like their characters, are deaf. CODA is the first Best Picture nominee with deaf actors as the main characters. Daniel Durant joins us today to talk about the film, and I'm talking with him with the help of a sign language interpreter, Gabriel Gomez. Gabriel and Daniel, welcome. Thanks for joining us. Hello, I'm happy to be here. And really, it's just an honor for having me. Thank you, guys. Oh, we're so happy, and congratulations. Thank you again, it means so much. I am betting that uh, your life has changed in a number of ways since filming wrapped up on CODA. All the attention surrounding the film, the, the Oscar, obviously. How would you describe what's happening in your life right now? Really, what's been happening so far with CODA, I'm just, I'm so excited and I'm so happy and thankful. After the award tour finished, I was just overwhelmed. Coming back to Duluth, it's just so many things are happening. My world is changing, like you said. And at the same time, I'm really thankful and I'm happy because, you know, Troy is the second deaf person to ever be nominated. And he won the Oscar as well. So finally, a deaf man has won the Oscar. And it's a huge honor. And again, our movie Coda has open captions on the screen. On every movie, when you watch it, it's captioned. So that's accessible for everyone. So there's so many things happening in history right now because of this movie. And it's just brilliant. It's changing history and it's changing perspectives about deaf culture. And I look forward to seeing more deaf roles and more deaf jo jobs opening up in Hollywood. Growing up myself in Duluth, I mean, I'm excited to get more scripts now and doors are opening and I'm not used to that feeling. So I used to get, you know, one script a year and now I'm getting so many. So it's an honor. And again, I'm happy because CODA helped me open doors for myself, but also open doors for other actors. And at the same time in myself, Daniel, I still feel like who I am. I love being an actor and I'm excited to work with new people and just travel through this journey, you know, I, this is just the beginning for me. I can't believe I won the Oscar of my first feature, but this is just the beginning. I want to work. When you were first uh, looking over the script for the film, what made you feel like the deaf community was going to be represented correctly? Really, there were so many things. And that's a good question. There's one scene that I love when Frank is signing and he's signing one of his dirty signs, you know, and it's so visual. And there's also, I could see some things in the script that I had never seen before in any other script. Our director, Sean, she did her homework. You know, she really knew what the deaf community went through and she understood deaf culture. So it was in the script and I read the script and I was very impressed from the start. And again, like you said, we had three deaf main characters and it wasn't like they were signing pretty. No, it was strong. It was showing our culture raw the way it is. And at the time, I already knew who Marley and Troy were. And seeing the script, it was so easy to envision them destroying those characters and making them their own because they're both brilliant actors. It's one of the best scripts I've ever seen. So again, I hope Hollywood recognizes and learns how to work with deaf people. And that way, and also they can contact Sean and see how it was to make a script like this and develop scripts and we can improve these things in the future. Well, speaking of roles, you brought so much enthusiasm and life to Leo. How much of Leo is Daniel? Really a lot. Again, Daniel, I'm from a small town, Duluth, and there's not many deaf people here. And I've always felt, I don't know, I've never felt like I belong. I, did, I never felt not equal or anything. And 
I feel like I'm deaf and that's okay. I can still play sports. I can still do whatever. I can be involved in anything, really. I was involved in a soccer team. I was acting. I've done so many things. I'm so enthusiastic about everything. And also, I'm so deep and strong in deaf culture. I love getting around with other deaf adults, even as a child. And I love conversating in my language. It's just, it's just a strong way to speak. And Leo is from a deaf family. So when I grew up, I wasn't a little, you would say little D or capital D for deaf, right? And I'm a capital D deaf guy, you know? I support the community, I don't use my voice. And Leo's the same. He cares about his business, he cares about the family, and there's two parallels there with Leo and Daniel, for sure. And I do use Tinder. Daniel uses Tinder like Leo. <laughs> <laughs> um, what is the preparation? This is more of a craft question, I suppose. What is the preparation that actors need to do on their own for a role? And what should you leave room for to discover in the moment of the scene? And I asked that because there was such an emotional scene that you had um, the fight with, with Ruby where you signed, we are not helpless. Um, how did you prepare for that scene? Well, it was really great because Sean could sign. So she learned a little bit of sign language and sometimes you could be direct with her and she would explain what she wanted directly to you and it's so important for an actor and their director to have a relationship so they could understand what kind of character they wanted. And before the big scene, the beach scene, I had already discussed with Sean and with our ASL master, Ann Tomasetti. We wanted to, we talked about what kind of emotions we wanted to feel and how Leo felt. And Leo was the older brother in the family. And before Ruby was born, he knew that life existed, you know, they did stuff without Ruby around. And once she was born, they depended on her for everything, interpreting the business, and they were ignoring Leo's ideas. So Leo was very frustrated. And when he got to the beach scene, it was the right time. Ruby found Leo and Leo really just let her know how he feels because he loves his sister and he always wants what's best for his sister. And it was her time to graduate from high school. She lost her childhood. She should have been out having fun with friends and doing things with the girls, but instead she was responsible for the fishing business and the family. And Leo saw that his whole life and he knew Ruby needed to do something better. She deserved to be happy on her own. And she had a gift. She can sing. And Gertie told Leo that she could sing and he believed it. So it's really a huge, just heart opening scene. And it was my favorite part of it because I love saying that deaf people aren't helpless. Don't pity us. I could throw that emotion out there. And that emotion came from Daniel. Growing up in that small town and people putting, giving me pity. And it's like, why? So yes, Daniel definitely was in there with Leo in that scene. Uh, Amelia Jones, who played Ruby, studied ASL for the role. And I'm wondering, you know, a lot of, uh, I have one deaf friend who relies on sign language, but also body language, you know, facial expressions. Um, how, did, how did Amelia do with you when it came to, and it's hard to learn ASL, how did she do with you in the cast? Amelia was really amazing. She's so talented and she's brilliant. I have huge respect for her because before Coda started filming, she practiced sign language for about a year. She trained with our ASL masters that were on set. And then when we actually started shooting, we all got together two weeks before so we could rehearse. And Amelia joined Troy, myself, and Marley for dinner on the weekends. And we would talk, you know? And there was no interpreter there. And we just shared things about our culture, deaf jokes, deaf tendencies, and she learned about us. And Amelia would tend to fingerspell because she knew how to fingerspell well. So we would teach her the sign and she would learn the sign. And she remembered everything quickly. She wouldn't forget. She picked it up so fast. So by the time the movie was done filming, like a year later and through COVID and everything, and we just saw Amelia again on the award tour, she was still signing and I was still talking with her without an interpreter. So again, I have huge respect for Amelia because 
she had to learn all these skills. She learned ASL, she changed her accent because she's actually from England. She could sing and she had to fish. Oh my goodness. So in the movie, she made it all look easy and I applaud her. You mentioned music. Now I know, uh, well, music plays a big role in the plot of the movie, but I also understand that um, you love music. And uh, I'm curious about how you, how you weave music into your life. Um, what do you do? How do you, how do you experience music? That's a great question. I love music. You know, just like the scene where you see Frank and his wife arrive to pick up uh, Ruby from school and they're listening to music and it's vulgar, but we can, they can feel the bass and they enjoy it. That's how deaf people feel. We turn it up because we can't hear the words. We don't really care what the music's about. But if you can feel that bass going to a rhythm, it feels great and it makes us want to dance just like hearing people. So I love feeling that. And I've been in a musical before on Broadway called Spring Awakening. And I did enjoy being part of a musical. I felt like, like ASL expression, going along with the beat and the music, with the choreography, it was just a beautiful experience. You know, deaf people have a lot of um, different ranges of deaf. Some deaf people can hear, some deaf people can hear out of one ear, some people can hear a lot of different levels. So a lot of people love music, yes. Now, is it true that as a youngster, you were jamming to National Public Radio? I heard that story and it sounded very funny. Yes, it's true. It's a true story. And I mean, it was, it was fun to tell on Kelly Clarkson, but yeah. Can you tell it for us? Would you mind? Sure. So when I was young, again, I'm from Duluth and I would play club soccer. So my mom and I, she was always willing to drive me around to different states or all around Minnesota. And we'd drive and I'd always ask my mom, can you turn up the music? make it louder, turn it all the way up so I can feel the music. And my mom would turn it all the way up, but it was hard, it hurt her ears. She was like, okay, I'm gonna buy a better sound system. So she installed a nice sound system in the car with a subwoofer and sure enough, I could feel the bass and I wasn't bothering my mom and the windows were shaking and I had a blast, it felt good. So one day we went to a store and we parked and I wasn't interested in going in the store. So I stayed in the car. And my mom went into the store and I was bored. And I realized we just got this new sound system. So I turned it on and I turned it up and I turned it louder and I was having a blast. It felt so good. I was dancing. And then a stranger pulled up next to me and it was a man. And he rolled down the window and he looked at me really weird, you know? And I just thought he must be impressed. He must be thinking I have a great sound system in the car and it's a great song. And I was just like, yes. And I danced to this man. And then another, a woman came up, same thing, rolled down her window and stared at me. And I was dancing, having a blast. It felt so good. And I wondered, what is this song? And when my mother came out of the store, she looked at me and started laughing. And she sat down next to me and I was like, what is the music I'm listening to? She said, you're listening to NPR pop radio. <laughs> that is a great story. Oh, I'm sure she laughed and laughed. That is a great story. And we thank you for jamming to National Public Radio. Thank you. <laughs> no, no, no problem. Now I'm happy to support NPR. <laughs> <laughs> and and now I'm learning you. and I've learned what talk radio and music sounds like. They sound different. And I thank NPR for teaching me. <laughs> um, you mentioned at the beginning of our conversation that you think that CODA will open doors now for many more deaf actors. I'm, I'm wondering, do you think there'll be a sequel because the movie was so good? Really, there's been discussion about it. We goof around about it and we would love for there to be a CODA 2 or really a series because sure enough, they announced that they're going to have a Broadway musical version of CODA already. They're developing it. They bought the rights from the movie. So that's exciting about that. But about more film or a series, I don't know. That's a huge question and I hope so because I would love to continue being Leo. I've heard the audience wants more too. And I mean, I would love to do that. It sounds great and it means that people like our movie and they want to see more, so I hope so. So now you've gotten back and had the uh 
the Duluth day. Uh, how are you relaxing in, in the midst of the swirl of the excitement? Have you had a chance to just decompress? Yeah, I mean, I'm just staying warm and staying inside, you know, trying to catch up on movies and video games. Really, I have so many emails and texts every day that I try my best to catch up on and I'm still not caught up. And I've recently going back to, I've gone back to work at school with a deaf student in second grade. I miss deaf mentor kind of, and it's my side job. It's fun to support the deaf community and teach. And I think I'm gonna go back to LA soon in about two weeks for more award tour stuff. And I'm looking forward to that. The school that you teach at, is that the one in Eveleth? Eveleth, yes. What did your deaf mentee say to you when you got back after uh, the Oscars and everything that's happened? I can, I can only imagine the conversation you had. Oh yeah. When I was in LA actually, he sent me a video with another mentor that was filling in for me. And he held up a big thing that said, good luck with a picture of an Oscar. And it touched me, you know, and it was before I was going to the Oscars. And then recently I got back to Duluth and that boy and his class made a whole big poster for me that said, congratulations, Daniel, for best picture and the Oscars. And they have it in the hallway. So I saw that. And again, I was touched. I talked with his parents and I know he's super excited to see me. And I know that, again, I'm just opening doors. If he sees that I can do it, he can do it too. Wow. You know what? I wish you all the best, Daniel. Um, we are so proud and I'm just uh, so curious as to what you're going to do in the future. I just want to keep acting. I want to keep opening doors and I would love to keep working with deaf children too in my downtime because really myself, I became successful because my moms, when they adopted me, right away started learning sign language and I can communicate with my mother. And sometimes my friends would come and they think my mom is deaf because she's so good at signing. But no, the communication is so important. And I just want you to know that 70% of deaf children have parents that don't learn sign language. And it impacts their future. It impacts their education, their social lives, everything. So again, I realize now I'm so lucky and it's very important for parents to be involved with their deaf children as much as they can. You're quite a role model, Daniel. I, I thank you for the conversation and Gabriel, thank you too for signing. No problem, thank you guys and happy to have us. I mean, we're happy to be here again.